Welcome back to another episode of Buckle Up with Simon and Brian, an ultra running conversation. How are you doing today, Simon? I'm doing great. We're just out of Bighorn 100, first mountain race of the season. It was muddy, it was hot, it was rainy, it was dry, it was all over the place, but it was a great adventure. But what about you, Brian? How are your knees? My knees are well. I am... Um... I'm getting higher um, in the mountains just each each week, it feels like, um, as the mount, the, the higher country is melting out. Um, I did follow a bit of Bighorn because they had trackers this year, so that was new, um, which was kind of fun as well. I was also following uh, Tahoe 200, um, which was uh, running concurrent as well, so I got to sit around and watch some dots on a map move really slowly, but, um, but I saw you were successful, so congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you're right. It's interesting to think that you have this little chip on your shoulder that connects all the way to the satellite, all the fuck way up there. And then <laughs> there are some people eating popcorn and watching your little dot just move every 10 minutes a little bit. Um, and you're right. I mean, my dot was moving very, very slowly. But our guest today, his dot was moving a little faster than mine. That's right. Anthony Lee um, is our guest tonight. And he is the overall winner of uh, the 2024 Bighorn 100. Uh, so congrats to him. Um, I met Anthony a couple years ago. Um, I want to say it was at Ure in 2021. Um, he won in a really a tough year, quite honestly. It was a, a huge torrential downpour on the first day. Um, and and then it eventually dried out for the second day. Um, but he was the eventual winner there. I downsized to the 50 miler and met him. Um, somewhere along the way and um, and have run into him in different um, locations f between here and there from 2021. Um, he's been in the sport about 10 years or so. Um, he's um, he's really freaking fast. If you look up at his ultra sign up, he is in the top 10 on more than half of the races he's done. And he's got 50 that are logged in there, um, which means he's done way more than that usually because ultra sign up doesn't get all of those nitty gritty races. Um, yeah, so really impressive resume from Anthony Lee. Yeah, it was great having him. Anthony is is both a very talented runner, but also hardworking uh, to his craft. Um, so very honored to have him. Uh, personally, I met him, I saw him the first time as a volunteer at URA, having no clue who that blue hair guy was. Um, and then I think it was you, Brian, telling me like, oh man, that guy actually won URA. And I think it, it speaks a lot about someone's character when you're such a high level athlete, but also taking the time to give back to the community, giving back to the sport. And ever since then, I kind of followed him uh, up mostly through social media, but then eventually we had quite a few races together. Well, he was racing. I was <laughs> holding for dear life to finish the race. Um, so kind of different uh, category, but um, it's been very interesting to see him. The, he, he's a very, He's a very good guy, a very positive guy. And it was interesting to discuss with him, to hear a little bit more about where he actually comes from uh, and seeing the the depth in terms of, you, you see the guy, you know, running super fast and smiling and cheering, giving high five and these things, but there is much more depth. And we were able to discover that in discussion, uh, which I think was really interesting and connects a little bit to your story, Brian. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't aware of the similarities um, prior to our conversation, so it was really nice to connect and hear more about his journey as well. Um, this year, I the first time I saw him was racing Hurt 100, uh, which he finished second, which is extremely impressive. And he was just flying on trail, and every time I would see him, I would say, "Hey, like good job!" And I think he recognized me, but I definitely could recognize him. And we, we got to talking online a little bit and realized that our calendars are kind of matching one for one, uh, which is interesting because I'm all over the place, but apparently he's also all over the place, obviously uh, Bighorn, but we also met for um, Fuji 100 mile in Japan. And for those who's followed my journey, um, Fuji was a little bit of a last minute thing for me. And I was very, very lost. Everything was organized in a last few days before the race i was super lost and i needed to figure out how to get to the start line which sounds easy but it was not and i was just so lost i reached out to anthony and i was i i didn't think he would respond but he actually took the time that's a pro runner taking the time to answer back to my stupid question about like 
dude, how the hell are you getting to the starting line? And he was super friendly, respond very quickly. He even said something like, oh, we have like a sponsor car. I would take you on, but like, unfortunately we're full. And that he would take the time to reply to to people like, like us. I mean, I, I don't know how to say it, but like average runner really shows that this guy is down to earth. And I, I really appreciate that, especially coming from someone who's, I mean, such a talented runner. So very positive. And I hope that this discussion today will help you understand what kind of person Anthony is. Yeah, he's definitely very grounded um, and humble. Um, it was a great conversation. Um, we hope that you guys enjoy it. We enjoyed um, talking with him. And here is the conversation with Anthony Lee. Thanks for coming on the show, Anthony. It's great to see you again. How's your day going? Uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on, Brian and Simon. Uh, my day's going really well. Awesome. You're just coming off a great weekend um, at the Bighorn uh, 100. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, stellar, stellar weekend. I'm really pumped. So uh, can't wait to dive in to all of it. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm super happy. I, I told Anthony, and we'll talk about Bighorn later a little bit, but I saw him at the start line and I didn't want to put pressure, but uh, my money was on you to win. And my goal <laughs> for the day was not even to finish the race. My goal was because it's a 50 mile in, 50 mile out, more or less. I, I wanted right. to see Anthony when I'm at 40 and he's at 60. And if that was the case, I felt, Anthony, you're going pretty slow, man. You can oh, go faster gosh. than that. <laughs> Did yeah, we will discuss. But did what? Where were you when we passed? Were you guys? Were you? Um, it was yeah, at the aid that's... station at like uh, I think for you must have been like fifty eight miles okay. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can't. I'm. It's like all blurring together. The aid stations were all kind of close. Um, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> for, for was... someone who's that fast, they were pretty close. For a <laughs> yeah. guy like me, <laughs> they were pretty far. But uh, um... yeah, sure. <laughs> it, it's all it's all relative it's all relative right yeah yes. we're all doing that we're all covering the same distance <laughs> <laughs> it just might take some of us longer anthony i get it i get it right hey mm -hmm. congrats again we're gonna dive into that any minute yeah. but let's back up let's back up like 10 plus years uh how did you get into the sport how did you find yourself here running big horn this weekend with the overall win uh how did this all come about oh man what a journey the last 10 years have been experiential and it's yeah been a it's been a crazy journey a dream come true um highs and lows like in the ultra um yeah so yeah basically 2013 uh i was going through a rough patch in my life i had just dropped out of uh, college and didn't know what i wanted to do uh, my sister introduced me to trail running back in the Northwest where I'm from. So just outside of Portland, Oregon. And it was the first trail race was a 25 K. Uh, it was through rain shadow running, um, James Varner, really great group of, uh, mm -hmm. race directors, up in the Northwest. And that's how I kind of got my toes dipped into the pool. And from there, um, I then did a couple shorter, trail race sub ultra races you would say before jumping into my first 50k um a couple months after that in 2013 and then yeah after getting a few 50ks under the belt uh the following season um i basically jumped into my first 120 miler uh through bigfoot 120 which was candace burt's race uh through destination trail and that runs from like Mount Adams to Mount St. Helens. And it's in, it was, it, it was in October at the time. So like a, like kind of a late fall. Well, yeah, like a mid fall, but like we thought we would get Indian summer, but we didn't. And it was torrential <laughs> downpours and uh, yeah, 40 mile per hour winds on the ridge line and 
man, that was a learning experience for my first couple hundreds. But that just spurred this whole, like, yeah, 10 year um, spell of chasing longer distances. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the little bit of the backstory. We can dive way deeper through yeah. everything. I'm curious, were you an athlete in college? Yeah, so originally, Simon, I wasn't um, an athlete at all. Like, I was like going back to my youth. Um, I was basically a non, uh, a non athlete. <laughs> I would say I was very sedentary, and uh, ate a lot of junk food. Uh, the American diet, like McDonald's, Burger King, uh, sat in front of the TV watching anime. Um, yeah, so had asthma growing up, and then like thankfully my siblings they uh took con like they gave me like some choices to um get into fitness and they were doing track and field when they were in their teens or teenage years and so i kind of followed in their footsteps and saw like if you kind of put in the hard work like the the results will show and yeah um just didn't have wasn't very studious um but yeah i got recruited and um, from there, I just, uh, yeah, wanted to run for sure. Like the goal was to be a professional athlete at some point, like, mm. yeah, Olympics may have been a far-fetched dream because like, oh, okay, you see the times being posted and it's like, okay, I run this and there's only marginal gains. Like I don't have the natural born talent, but I can definitely outwork, uh, pretty much anyone, uh, on any given day. So that's where I, I like I just yeah the mental fortitude for sure is what I've gained uh, over many of my like competitors I, I think you're being humble to say that you don't have the natural <laughs> ability I see though what you mean a little bit with you you know when we look we little people look at a guy like he was like wow like you really have crazy ability but at the same time I can see how and then you know stepping to Olympic might be a fetch but I think being able to be realistic about it is is very impressive. And I really like the story also. It really shows I mean, the importance of family, of sibling, the positive impact uh, that it can have on your life. Uh, very, very positive story. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, I there's been so many turbulent times, I think, in my like youth um, and my teenage years. I wasn't like, yeah, I, I tried to get good grades and then like, I kind of fell down this dark path, like off the, off the path, like the straight and narrow, getting into the wrong crowd, getting into drugs. Um, yeah, kind of just like, yeah, taking the, the like low life kind of easy way out to get things. And yeah, it just kind of bites, bites you in the butt a little bit. So yeah, it's, it's been a journey for sure. Um, I mean, we can definitely talk about it. Like I'm happy to explain the situations. Um, but yeah, I think like when we come to ultra running, like we have this really unique community that like, I mean, yeah, uh, I've, I've seen it all. Like there's the drug, the former drug addicts that come into ultra running, the, the former convicts. And I mean, yeah, I, kind of see myself as a degenerate what was a degenerate um and then yeah ultra running long distance running uh kind of saved my life and uh yeah I, I mean i could definitely be like homeless or like or yeah i've been homeless and i could definitely be like in a jail cell like again like i've had those experiences and i know like for a fact that ultra running and like the people that like my family and the friends I have that like haven't given up on me, they, I mean, just to know where I've been and where I can tell that story, like, and see like the perspective, like from my former self, like how much I've grown. Um, yeah. The, the community is so accepting and I'm just so happy to be part of it. And like, yeah, like there is, there can there can be change like people can grow if they have that goal and yeah i definitely didn't want to be stuck looking up at the well um from the bottom of the well and 
Um, but yeah, so there was a slimmer of light and, uh, yeah, I took, I like, it was that opportunity for sure to change my life and ultra running has definitely done that in a positive way. That's a great inspirational story. I appreciate you sharing it. I, um, I have a similar journey as well. Um, but I'm, uh, but Anthony, uh, to be honest, I'm quite a bit older than you are. I believe that you're 30 years old. I just turned 50 this year. Um, okay, and it yeah. took me, a, it took me a much longer time to figure out my way. And so, um, I commend you for, um, finding your path at an early age and changing that direction, um, more quickly than I was able to do it myself. <laughs> I'm still proud of myself and my accolades, but where I'm just going is that you were able to flip that switch and find a different direction at a much younger age, which is really impressive. Yeah. Again, like the support system and I think like just not like coming from an Asian background, like we have all these high standards and like, it's not just cliches, but um, yeah, like I, I definitely wanted to make my family proud and change the direction, like not be the black stain on on the family i mean i'm still a kind of a black sheep for sure <laughs> doing these like ultras like it's mm -hmm. counterculture to everything else like um that my hey, other you're not a doctor basically yeah exactly <laughs> or like yeah it's it's not like the natural path of what is standard in asian culture like um like accountant doctor engineer so i i found my own path and I'm very happy with it and my family are very supportive now and they see uh, like how happy I am and they are able to support me and come to races and uh, crew and spectate. So it, it's really heartwarming for me to see that. Like it, it wasn't like that before. Like um, it could have definitely taken a turn if I didn't get my act together. Yeah. Again, I appreciate your story and um, it, it's, it's, Again, to your point, it's pretty relatable in the ultra running scene um, where we, right. we've all come from some sort of uh, struggle or challenge um, all too often. And, and we found um, we found um, some peace and some solace in an ultra running itself. Yeah, yeah I think it's a pretty common theme. Yeah, I think it's a pretty common theme. And I, I, what I'm curious to hear, because I, I think of all of the three here, I'm the goody, goody <laughs> guy that has never had problem and just went and did his phd and that's kind of my story but um <laughs> but it feels that ultra running helps you catalyze your your energy or kind of your like you you have a direction you have a structure that is helpful but i feel also that do or i'm curious to know do you think also you're you're using that past and that energy to help you when you're getting in dark place in the run when it when it's very difficult because you're pushing the pace and you're pushing the limit so you have to have something driving you to to go further than other people. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, definitely trying to not outrun like some demons, but use them as fuel. Uh, that's what I would say. Um, yeah, I, I just like the competition. Like I am very competitive now. Um, and yeah, I just want to push the limits like of myself like it, there could be other people that are faster but like maybe like if they out outwork themselves or like go out too hard like i'll still be the consistent person that keeps keeps on their heels and then yeah i'm i'm there at the very end uh, i'm not gonna give up so yeah it's all these past experiences definitely like they're in the back of my head like learning and um yeah i think it's 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 definitely a motivator for myself yeah if we speak of not giving up and i think we'll talk about your your season very soon but i was at fuji also and i think you mm -hmm. had a pretty rough patch i was <laughs> racing so i couldn't watch you but i oh heard people gosh. tell me that uh, while seeing Anthony go out, I think it was mile 70 where I don't know at the Nate station. Um, <laughs> they didn't think he would kind of make it, but, oh, but you gosh. did. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, we did connect on Instagram beforehand and you asked me like about Mount Fuji, like course beta from, cause I ran it in 2023 and, uh, or someone, maybe I'm mixing you up. Uh, still have some brain fog from Bighorn, but yeah, <laughs> Mount Fuji was just in April. So pretty much about a month and a half. Um, yeah, I feel like May just disappeared on us. 
mm-hmm. and just recovering. But yes, like Simon's saying, like I did suffer. Uh, I thought I could learn from 2023 and yeah, all the changes. Like, so instead of a 2 p.m. start in 2023, there was a midnight start and it was just vastly different uh, in preparation, just staying up all day um, instead of like kind of having it midway start in the middle of the day. Um, But yeah, the midnight start was very fast. Uh, Like I ran with Courtney DeWalter and yeah, we were in like the top 10 or so. And I didn't think that we were running too fast. I thought we were running really controlled, but the first 50 K is much, is a lot of road. And, oh man, like by a hundred K my legs were just shot. Like, I don't know if it was the humidity. I was, yeah, I misjudged an aid station for sure. Uh, I thought that the aid station before hundred K was at like 92 kilometers based off of the map that I had saw, uh, I had seen. And Oh man, I misjudged it by like eight kilometers. So I ran out of fluids and calories in that section. So yeah, I pretty much bonked. Um, My friend from Japan, Hayato, um, he was trying to help me because he caught me in the section. um, And I just couldn't keep pace. My quads were blown. And uh, yeah, it was not a good time. And then, I mean... I just needed a break when probably you heard some news. Like I sat, I like laid down. There's a photo of me like wrapped up in my bivy uh, and like a nice like down jacket. um, Just like kind of resetting and getting a massage and talking it through with my crew. And yeah, from there it was just like, okay, I have a marathon left. And it's like a back heavy hundred. So Mm -hmm. man, like, yeah, those last climbs were brutal because I couldn't run descent or the descent of any of them. And then, yeah, I just couldn't, yeah, just like put any food down, but like, I didn't have any issues with like my energy. It was just, I couldn't run with my quads being blown, but yeah, I just, again, I've suffered enough. Like, It was my 22nd 100, so I have gone through that before, and it was just, okay, you can get to the finish line, just one foot. It's just going to take a little bit longer. Like, it's just sad when I see elite athletes give up, and it's not their day, and they're, yeah, like, I'm in, I'm in, like, eight, I'm, like, keep dropping back in places, like, from the top, from the top 10, and It's just like, oh, man, my my goal was to be in the top 10 because then you get to go up onto the podium and everything. And it's like a it's a major uh, recognition for this race being ultra or world trail majors. But Mm -hmm. yeah, from there, it was just like, okay, reshift the goals, like just make it to the next aid station, make it like just make it small enough. Um, And then, yeah, you're just going to eventually get to the finish. But yeah, I improved to 17th like I improved but one place which is like a good sign I guess um I'm happy with that but there's still a lot of learning um yeah I think I messed up some electrolytes and just didn't run my race since I was running with Courtney and everyone was getting on hyped on the Courtney train and uh yeah from there it was just like okay I can get this done but it's going to be a lot slower I think it's impressive that you finished anyway. You know, I, I think it's pretty common with pro athletes. And I, I, maybe you've done that and it's totally fine to, well, this is not my day. Um, I'm just going to yeah. pull the plug. There's no point. But And you say, oh, I only improved by one place. I mean, that's one way to say it if you stay steady. But the fact that you were really struggling right. means that you probably would have dropped a lot, lot. So you improved by one place instead of degrading by a lot. And I think that shows strength of character and your ability to to get it done really to go and dig really deep um and and accept accept the mistakes accept the failure accept the the difficulty and push forward which i think is really really inspiring right yeah i was saying to my crew like 
I'm not injured. Like, it's just soreness. Like, the blown quads is just major soreness and lactic acid and uh, whatever. Like, if there was something really wrong, like I broke in a bone or I was going to put myself in, like, really harm's way, like, mm. it would that would have been, like, the cause to dnf like a reason to yeah. dnf uh but yeah i think most of these elite runners like they're just it's just like ah oh, yeah like I, I can pack it in and yeah save it for another day like i i have done that like bandera 2022 like going for a golden ticket i had injured myself going into it and then i re-injured myself and it was just stupid to run another 50k on an injury yeah. um so i did pack it in like there are cases like that and i'm not like the only one that should say i i haven't done it um there have yeah. been times which is so, totally yeah. normal you know right. you, you have a yeah. season to think about your body is your work yeah. and if you're gonna hurt the whole season by saying oh like i, I still want to finish this race that doesn't make sense for for people like you so that is very well understood and understanding mm -hmm. the difference between soreness and you're getting injured is, is super yeah. important for a guy like you right um and speaking of season, maybe maybe we can talk a little bit uh, about kind of the the few races that you're doing this year, uh, yes. well, that you've done and that you're yep. doing. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. Um, it's been a quite a long season for most people, I would say. Uh, like if they were to look at my calendar, it's just like, okay, each month is almost pretty packed. Um, yeah, so I started the year with the Hurt 100 in January out in Hawaii. And uh, that went amazing. Like from the training block that I started in October, um, going back to self-coached, um, I had changed a lot of like things in my diet uh, like four weeks before the race in December. But training those few months after being self-coached uh, for Hurt in January was amazing. Um, and then, yeah, the diet shift was great. Um, so I went to high fat, uh, high protein, low carb. And I then just didn't have any gastric bonk or like gastric issues like nausea or like, yeah, big spikes in energy or big lows or bonking. So, um, yeah, that was amazing. And I ended up second place at Hurt. Uh, behind, behind a good friend, Eeyore, uh, from Canada. And then um, can, in February... Sorry, can I just ask yeah. you, just because I, I'm very curious, right. can you be more specific about how you change your diet? Um, and <laughs> is it just the, the race itself or it's also the training and then during the race you, you eat differently like that? Yeah, so in December, I, I mean, last, like all of 2023, I had been suffering from bonking and nausea like in the mount fuji i like vomited and uh was suffering from gastric issues and then uh utmb i also was like nauseous and uh i was like okay i need to fix something because like every race like it's just like hit or miss like i will bonk in a way but like yeah just taking too much fuel like I just wasn't focused on the nutrition, like as I should have been, like just putting but in. It was what I rich, was, what you were doing. Yeah, exactly, and like, just now reading about all the science and like how much your body actually absorbs, like it, mm -hmm. it's not as much as you would think. I can't, I don't know the numbers off the t top of my head, but it, it is not as much as we should be putting into our body, um, and. Yeah, so I, I followed this Jeff Browning, like I was reading Jeff Browning's blog um, about how he was like suffering from bonking and nausea and puking in races and how, yeah, he made this switch back in 2016 or 2015 into 2016 for his hurt 100. But he had seven weeks and I only had four weeks, so it was not a, it was definitely not a smart decision. I don't recommend anyone to do this change because man, I felt so bad mental fatigue, like, cause your, your body is just so like right now, like, or in general, like our bodies, if, 
if, if this was me back in December, it's just like, oh, it's such a carb heavy diet. Like our brain needs those carbs. And so when I just cut them basically to like 10% of my diet, it really was noticeable, like just so lethargic, mental fog. Um, and yeah, it just like really affected workouts. And I was like, oh man, like, should I even be doing this so close to the race? Um, but I stuck with it. I knew like it would be worth it because I've seen the longevity of Jeff and like a bunch of other high fat, high protein athletes. And they're just doing so many amazing things there. And then uh, re reporting no gut issues or like luck there or like less of it. So I was like willing to try anything. And then I really was, yeah, I just wanted to be a guinea pig for myself. Um, it's like, okay, um, if it works, it, then great. If it doesn't, like, all right, I'll have to try the next thing. I think that's, we're all N of one. And yeah, so that was my shift. So I, like, day, like now I, I live this high fat, high protein lifestyle um, of eating like bacon, eggs, like grass fed meats and uh, very whole food, uh, nose to tail uh, diet. Um, and then I also use this supplement called Vespa, which is one of my sponsors now after the Hurt 100. Um, I knew of them back in 2013, but they're a little bit of an expensive product. And it's not even a gel. It's a supplement like made from honey, bee propolis, um, a Japanese wasp extract, which like somehow concocted together like when you take it, it like basically helps you oxidize fat. Um, uh, your it's OFM oxidized fat metabolize metabolism. And, uh, yeah, you're just not, you just don't need to take as many gels or like chews or whatever. And you can use your body's reserves that you have, like, obviously we don't have that much fat, so you do need to be strategic with carbs and everything, but yeah, your body has so much fat that you can tap into. Um, and, and like ketones are another thing, like that's a whole nother world, like that I had to like study on. Um, so yeah, this, it, it is really, really crazy science. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like this change that I've done and my daily life and then racing to continue on that. It's like, usually I was pumping 400 calories uh, because I was being coached and that was like the practice that was being preached and that's kind of being preached everywhere. It's like, all right. Um, yeah. You need to be pumping yourself with high amount, like 80 to 90 up to 120 grams of carbs. I'm like, yeah, that's like pretty high for most people. Um, and these studies are just like people that are on a bike like in the Peloton and whatever, but like you're running, you're jostling. So like people can practice that, like get your gut bomb proof. But for myself, like I do better. I did better once I switched and doing like less like gels. So I was doing like two gels an hour, which is like 45 to 60 grams um, of carbs, which is relatively low. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of my, nutrition plan at the mo like which is like what i've been doing since hurt and yeah it was amazing um and supplementing the vespa also so long story Anthony, you were, I, I heard you were flying man like that was <laughs> yeah that, you were there yeah. too right yeah yeah and, yeah, and, yeah, and right. you were always so nice i would say ah, good job anthony and you would just fly it was <laughs> insane like people that I don't know that trail, it's super technical and then you see someone like anthony just <laughs> running faster than if i was running a single mile i was like man like he's he's on fire he really wants to be done so that was really cool yeah that was i mean man what a pr day like again like i've done hurt three times like my first year in 2019 was 31 hours suffered through it 2022 was a, a second year and then suffered through it with gut issues, but improved by like five hours because I knew like I was just wasting time at aid stations. And then again, like this year uh, for my third time, I again cut off like five hours. It's like 
wild and i was just like i didn't have the gut issues i had energy like no lows it was so consistent like constant energy just because i may have been fat adapted for a bit um and not having these issues and yeah i mean we had a special course which was a little bit faster but i mean like twenty seven thousand feet of gain or something and yeah no it was a special day for sure i'm i'm like yeah to be second in that race like and cut off five hours it's like unimaginable for most people but yeah it happened yeah anthony i want to back up a second and ask a question about um that change you made in december it was a i mean i think that um the diet change is is fairly drastic i mean it's not um crazy drastic or or (laughs) life-threatening by any means but but it's a a big significant change and you also mentioned um you went to self-coaching were they were they all intertwined together in like some some bigger picture of like a complete change of your process um, to get to the starting line? I mean, yeah. So I've been uh, co well, I've been self coached for like eight years, and that like for the first eight years from twenty thirteen to about twenty twenty one, there have been some mentors helping me along the way. Uh, back in Washington in the Pacific Northwest, um, like Yassine Daboon and everything like that. Um, but then, yeah, I went when I first when I moved to Colorado, like I had just been doing my own thing in 2018. Um, but yeah, so I, I got coached by David and Megan Roach for a little bit, like from 2022 after that hurt 100. I wanted to go after some golden tickets. Um, for Western States. And I was just noticing in that year and a half, um, a little bit more than a year and a half that I was like, I was having fun, like building speed and everything again, because I had just primarily been doing hundred milers. Like I didn't do anything shorter than that. I probably do like three to four, one hundreds a year. And yeah, I just noticed like, I was getting injured. My body wasn't like recovering as well because I was doing so much speed. Um, And it's not like anyone's fault. Um, I just like, yeah, I just tried to do the prescribed workouts, but it just didn't work out, sadly. And that's when I left in 2023, uh, October and uh, before going into this year. Um, So I made those changes for myself because I've had success by myself and like writing my own training plans. And like, I am a a USCA coach myself. um, So I know like the training principles and just, I know my body obviously uh, and what it's, what it wants to do, what I love to do. And yeah, what I'm, yeah. So what I'm passionate about is like climbing and yeah, I do mix some speed in because I, I mean, I, I do like the fast stuff. Like I ran like 435 in high school and have like a fast 5k time, but like, I'm not going to touch those speeds now. Um, but yeah, I just like know myself and I love just grinding up hills and racking up vert. So I love those races. So I, I knew what I had to do for hurt in 2024 and yeah, that's why those changes. And then yeah, for the diet, Brian, um, yeah, I, I think they're drastic. And I just wanted to ex- be a guinea pig on myself, like I said before. Um, yeah, I think you can advocate for yourself, your health, and yeah, do all these things um, at the end of the day. So I believe, like, yeah, we are all capable of making choices for better or worse. Um, I don't know like, yeah, there's still the jury's out on running 100 miles, like, it's definitely not healthy, but we do it anyways. Um, And so yeah, I think like, making these dietary changes uh, was a big, a big change for sure. And it was a positive one for myself. Like, yeah, I'm not a nutritionist. And I'm not trying to sell anything to anyone. But like, just try something and it could work out for the better or yeah, it could work out for the worse. Like you never know. Um, it's all, we're all just here having a human experience. Um, and yeah, just trying to make it through 
one day at a time. Yeah, that's great. I um, I just wanted to see if there was any correlation between like dropping the coaching process and going back to self coaching and the dietary changes. And they they almost yeah, align no. a little bit. It seems like you're yeah. maybe leaning that way. And uh, yeah, it, it it's obviously uh, paying off. Um, um, <laughs> and you, we've already been through hurt in January. Um, what else did you right. do? Um, what else do you got going on? Yeah, yeah. So um, after her, I went to Hong Kong for Chinese New Year's with my family and hopped in a 50k race, um, which was kind of last minute. Didn't know because it was like a couple weeks after her. Um, but I ended up second there as well. Um, Race some really fast under the radar Asian athletes uh, from the Philippines and Hong Kong. Um and then I got to go to Argentina. So I was in, in the sta- I was only in the States for like nine days in February. Um, yeah, after Hong Kong, I went to Argentina like the day after I returned um, on a photo shoot. Um, and then, yeah, I got to just run around in Argentina and Patagonia, which is amazing. Um, and then March was a, a like kind of a rebuild for Mount Fuji. So got back to the States and just grounded myself. Um, yeah, just putting my head down and trained through a little bit of a, a milder winter here in Colorado. Um, it's kind of a blur. Uh, don't remember March and then April clearly was Mount Fuji. Um, and then May was another grind month before Bighorn. So yeah. Um, that's kind of a big year for anybody um, just getting into the sport, let alone someone that is experienced. um, But I still have more on the calendar. So like Simon said, like um, I am signed up for Quebec mega trail uh, July 4th weekend, uh, which I think he is like, it's so weird, like how our calendar synced up. Um, So I'm doing QMT or signed up to do QMT. And then uh, after QMT, I have Crazy Mountain 100 in July uh, in Montana at the end of... So, yeah, July is brutal. Uh, so, yeah, QMT, uh, I'm pacing Hard Rock for a really good friend of mine. And then I might be crewing High Lonesome. And then I'm running Crazy Mountain 100. Like, the whole month of July, is each weekend's gone. Um, and then... August, I have TMR, Telluride Mountain Run 40 miler through one of my sponsors. So that's kind of what I had signed up for. Like, not like I just didn't have anything else planned after that because it's such a big year um, with adventures and uh, travel, um, racing itself. So I definitely want to take a break and I know I should take a break. Like, I've done this to myself where I get overly amped up. Um, and try to do everything and that's been me in the butt like adrenal fatigue or stress reaction or yeah some some form of burnout um so i definitely want to just be smart about that um listen to my body take it day by day but yeah signed up for the next thing is qmt um which simon will be at as well um but yeah that's kind of how i plan this year um yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's heavy. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. stacked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't sure. rec. I don't. Yeah, I don't we, recommend it. But yeah, just for myself, like, I want to ex- experience it all and test the, test the mind and body. Yeah, I mean, to do the absolute limit for sure. And I think, and yeah, it, it's funny because we were talking. I think it was maybe it was Fuji. I can't even remember when it was, but we were talking about what are the race coming up and. We kept saying a race. And I was like, "Oh, you're gonna be there too. Oh, you're gonna be there too." Um, the difference, of yeah. course, just so that's pretty clear, is that I'm not racing them. So for me, I can just hang out in the back, whereas Anthony is just gunning for it all the time, and that's oh, such a man. big difference in terms of how punishing it could be for your body. Like it, even for for people to uh, compare, like if I run a marathon distance, I'm not necessarily tired afterwards, but if I go for a PR. I'm going right. to be wrecked afterwards. Even if I run longer distance, going for a PR is always difficult. So when you're fighting for a podium, it's always going to be, it's always going to be super destructive. You really need to push 
the limit of what yeah. you can do and what kind of a human body can do performing at, at the highest level so yeah definitely uh hit hit the nail on the on the head um <laughs> just uh yeah i think the biggest thing is like the recovery component um the the biggest thing i've seen with this dietary change is how fast i'm able to bounce back and obviously like there are like some small little aches and pains but generally like having this high protein high fat it's been able to absorb most of the inflammation and i like carbs are such a inflammatory type like yeah it's it's not like a bad thing like i'm not saying carbs are bad it's just again strategically using them in a way to like fuel your runs is like much more advantageous like this is the secret like you definitely need to practice this i don't recommend like go fast and run for three hours like i can able i can do now but it's just like yeah the high fat high protein is able to absorb all this damage and like yeah i'm i'm four days removed from the race like and sometimes it's more sometimes it's less like after hurt uh i was able to w do air squats at the finish and walk like five miles the next morning uh like yeah slowly but i was still able to do it and like i just movement is helpful in any way but yeah i've noticed like the recovery component is so crucial after like and beneficial after these like eating high protein like yeah we just did something so crazy and long like you need all of that fuel back but um yeah carbs and this is not to be negative about carbs like do they just get a bad rap but it's all those sugars and your body can absorb so like only so much of it and then we overindulge and then yeah it's just it's all this like high inflammatory kind of fuel um that just gets stuck like wherever it is in your body um and that's why like people get like cankles or like the puffiness after races and you don't have to suffer through that like most people just need to eat more protein um but yeah like again like the calendar is stacked and I, again i'm just taking it race by race and obviously like i do want to push the limits like you got like not yeah like back of the pack and middle of the pack like i have so much respect for everyone out there like even though i'm getting done faster you guys are still doing the distance and I'm so inspired by everyone, like just trying to tackle their goals or to see if they can even run a hundred miles. Like it's, it's, you can't, you just don't know. And yeah, there can be good races and bad, but um, yeah, life is, it's like a journey for sure. Yeah. Spe speaking of good races, I think we should talk about Bighorn a little bit. Um, how did it go? How was your day? What did you think of the course and everything? And I think, so it was it's it looks like it was a pretty tight competition with the second place so i guess there were yeah. some battles there where i don't know how aware you were that he was so close but he was there yeah <laughs> yeah no it was definitely much closer than i thought it was going to be um yeah so bighorn was a great day i clearly broke the tape um or maybe no one knows and uh, <laughs> but uh yeah i broke the tape uh <laughs> oh man yeah, spoiler just, alert people you yeah know? <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah um but oh man so okay the day was amazing like it was supposed to be hot but the forecast said it was going to be hot but we lucked out with overcast skies and it was a little humid like a 9 a.m start um and we started a little bit late because it was the first year that they had trackers and uh they didn't want to let anyone not that didn't have a tracker be left behind so all right we started a little late um but after the gun went off or the countdown um yeah i just like took the lead uh right off the bat and i was like okay who's gonna come with me i didn't expect to take the lead i thought it was gonna be a little bit more like relaxed going um because yeah it's 100 miles like don't take the lead um the mile the race does not start until 100 or sorry 70 mile 70 so the race does not start to mile 70 as jeff browning says carl meltzer says um and i just wanted to keep the the effort like smooth like consistent and like spread it evenly um 
also another tidbit or another mantra is like spreading the peanut butter evenly uh, throughout the race, um, like Jeff Browning says. And okay, so getting sidetracked. Um, but yeah, so uh, Charlie from Montana, he's this young gun, uh, 22 year old uh, nursing student, I believe he said. But yeah, second 100 miler. Um, he did Big Horn last year as well. And he caught up to me and was like, all right, let's like, hey, who, how are you? And we started chatting um, from like mile eight. Um, yeah, we basically worked together. There was another guy named Ted from Golden. Um, but yeah, we started chatting. The three of us made our way to the first major aid station at 13, which is Dry Fork. Um, and I was in and out of Dry Fork like within under like under 30 seconds, I think um and yeah charlie came with me uh ted stayed back i think we cooked him on the first initial climb uh and i didn't think like we were going too fast but um yeah it was it was definitely smooth so yeah from dry fork it's a bunch of rolling uh downhill um it was super great trail conditions i thought um we didn't get the early mud uh, that like Bighorn typically has. And what I've heard uh, from other friends and watching YouTube videos of the race just to get course beta. And my crew chief is from Wyoming and she's done the race and gave me all that intel ahead of time, uh, scouting wise. So I knew what to expect. Um, but yeah, there's just like some river crossing, some snow melt off uh, and the feet kind of got a little wet early. Um, but yeah, Charlie and I, the second place finisher, uh, we basically ran from mile eight to like the out and back section to Jaws, uh, about halfway. Um, and we were just like leapfrog, like sharing the lead. Um, and yeah, when he went to the bathroom, I would take the lead a little bit and then he would catch back up. Same thing. Like when I use the bathroom, like I've perfected the walk and pee, um, <laughs> So I would just like walk and he would be like a little bit ahead, but still moving forward, like just constantly making forward progress in the race. Um, and uh, yeah, so we stayed together like and then at Jaws, like we got rained on. We got a torrential downpour, like thunderstorm. We saw lightning and we're like, oh, great. We're in the middle of an open field uh, with no tree coverage and there's lightning and we hear the booms around us and um yeah so it was just like okay get to the aid station i don't have my rain gear i have like this like long sleeve shirt um that's able to protect me a bit and my bivy but I, i'm not gonna break out the bivy but like the long sleeve helps and so i get to jaws at like 48 or whatever halfway point um before the turnaround and then I gap Charlie there and cause he wanted to, st or he stayed a little bit longer. So I was on my way in out or inbound, sorry. So coming back towards you guys um, to the finish and Charlie stayed at Jaws for like 20 minutes to change his socks. Um, and I was like, okay, like he'll probably catch up. Like he's, he's great on the descents. Like I was noticing like he was so fast on those descents and I was getting him on the, um, on the ups, on the uphill. So, yeah, he he did end up catching me uh, back going into foot foot bridge, Sally's foot bridge um, at like 66. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was just like lagging. Um, I was just like trying to, to like overdo it or like, again, my race doesn't start till 70 at least. Um, so, yeah, I didn't want to cook myself, just keep feeding the body um yeah so from there he caught back up and then he was like oh i want to get to sally's footbridge by sunset so we can do the wall uh going back up to dry fork um the last crew spot before like dark so you could see it and i'm like okay that's 66 miles like 12 hours like sunset it was around like 8 30 8 45 9 so yeah, we definitely didn't make it. I think we were like just like 45 minutes shy of that, but it was dark by the time we got to 66. And then he went to use the bathroom, 
because he was not feeling great. Um, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to wait. So I'm, I took the lead and, uh, yeah, it's like a grind of a hill, um, up to like, there's some aid stations in between, um, because it's 66 to 86. So there's like the 20 miles there up between, um, yeah. So I gapped him on the hill. Cause I, I, I do like think my strength is climbing. So put some time in on him there, got to back up to my crew, um, and was like, okay, I have 18 miles left. Uh, I cannot walk this because I know they're behind me and my feet are just so trashed at the moment. Like just going through all the snow drifts, uh, and boggy mud later on in the race and not changing my socks, but like dumping out rocks and things so like there was only like 30 min 32 minutes of stoppage time or like aid station time for me uh from my strava um so that was good i think i could still reduce it but um yeah i think I, again i just had no time because i thought i had more and i'm glad i ran everything that i could because my quads weren't blown out yet um all the way to the finish and yeah like when I finished I was like elated but I just knew like okay they're really close because at one of the last aid stations before you get to the road um and there's still five miles they said okay there's three guys behind you that just hit the last one and I was like okay that's like it's still like five miles but again they're they're really close like it it's still going to be very tight. Um, and so I had to run everything. And then the roads is like pancake flat. So it's just like, all right, you just got to shuffle everything. Like, yeah, it's not, you don't have to power hike, but like you have to shuffle. Um, this is where, yeah, this is where like things are very crucial. Um, it's like run all the downhills, shuffle the, shuffle the flats and power hike the hills. That's like, the main like anyone can tell you those are the three things to be successful at races if you do that you're probably going to complete most of your races and you're going to be very smart to not overdo yourself um but yeah so my feet were really beat up because of all the rocks and the bogginess like for running at like just not changing wet socks so I got trench foot a little bit and I've had that before so I knew what to expect I just was like biting my tongue uh it's just like okay be a robot um and just like yeah just get to the finish as as fast as i can and then man i somehow like crossed the finish line first and then was able to sit down um but yeah it was a very like a long-winded way to say like it it was much closer because like i then hear cheers and like it's 12 minutes later like it's almost like a, a fast mo like a late mile like in a race like 12 minutes is not that much uh so it's almost like a like for yeah I just like it's almost like a mile and a half if you're like running fresh but like in an ultra in that long of a race it could it's just like a mile pretty much so he was very close on my heels and then the third place guy was like six minutes back so yeah the total men's podium was like 18 minutes which was pretty amazing um yeah i just didn't know that third guy play like push so deep to catch back up because charlie and i like up until that point we had like come back from the halfway point and they hadn't even come close to getting to where like where we were um yeah but they they put on the late surge that i yeah it was incredible like just to hold on and kind of be fearful like i again i'd rather be the hunter than the hunted so yeah pretty pretty good day yeah I, yeah it's amazing and it's amazing to hear um it's interesting to hear also kind of the segment that you described and thinking is that how i felt myself um uh, how, <laughs> how did you feel for example um you know the the race start like we're on the road then we have kind of a single track that just goes a little bit up and down and then you have kind of a big climb that goes on forever uh, which was mm. totally fine on that mm -hmm. way. But how did you feel coming downward? Especially you talked about your quads not being destroyed. And if there were any segment that would destroy the quads, was that downhill? Um, <laughs> you, 
you, you didn't yeah. struggle at all i mean it's amazing yeah. to me like that downhill is just a I, I need to say it but it's a bitch yeah. and i mean my <laughs> wife that i was facing was not oh. happy with me at oh all. oh um, no okay yeah. yeah um yeah no i didn't i love the uphill like we were just like trotting like yeah if it got steep like to the point of like oh this is not efficient running like then we'd power hike but mm. for the most part we were at least shuffling uphills um also which was remarkable because i was just like okay someone's gonna blow up and we never we both didn't blow up for the longest time and then charlie is definitely a strong downhill runner like he took off when he had to get down to sally's footbridge he like put like 40 seconds on me in like a, f a blink of an eye um and there were still people coming up uh from sally's footbridge at that point when we were making our way down um and yeah we were like 30 miles ahead of the last couple people uh which was crazy to think about uh but they were saying oh yeah like he's only 40 seconds i was like holy crap this guy just put 40 seconds on me like i was just right by him like he really wanted to get down to the aid station. I don't, I don't know why, like he just did. Um, but then, yeah, I was like, okay, it's still too early to like go after it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just you need took to not panic. Right. You need right. to understand what you're saying. I, I'm curious. I was did to, you, yeah. did you, did you try to test him? Like, did you try to break him knowing that your strength is the uphill? Let's push the pace a little bit and let's try to have him follow me and potentially just like poop himself. Um, I did not push. I mean, yeah, I was definitely trying more on the uphills. Like I did notice like, oh, okay. Like he is hiking uphills and I'm just trotting up them like at my own pace, but like, I'm not breaking stride. And then I'm like, okay, like this is good to know for the future or like down the road or down the trail. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, again, was not trying to over pace myself or outpace my own ability uh, again, keeping it steady. But yeah, I just noticed like he was trying to keep up a little bit, maybe uh, like we both had the same goal of going under 20. Like, like, what was your time goal? Like we would ask each other. It's like, yeah, I think 20 hours is possible on this day, like with the course conditions. And uh, yeah, I mean, we both struggled at the very end. Like we had some positive splitting. Um, but yeah, it's just like not to make it like a big positive split is the main mm -hmm. is the main thing but yeah Anthony, uh, you, yeah you have yeah. a lot you have a lot of experience in other um mountainous um adventures um across colorado um and i i'm familiar with bighorn i raced it last year um it was mm. <laughs> super wet and muddy and sloppy um so different yeah. conditions this year i would imagine but i don't know um that's what it sounded like but how right. do you think Bighorn compares in the grand scheme of mountainous 100s. You know, it, does it does it have its place there, or is it um, or or is is it maybe a little more faster and flat? What, what what's your uh, what's your stand on that? Oh, I think it is a mountainous hundred. Um, yeah, it is on the Hard Rock qualifying list, and anytime you have a race that's on a Hard Rock qualifying list, there's a reason behind that. Whether it's altitude uh can like footing like yeah altitude yeah again i'm repeating the altitude thing but altitude uh course conditions uh footing and just how technical it is um basically yeah i think it does belong in the mountain category it's not f it on paper like yeah the seventeen thousand feet doesn't seem like much or whatever I got on my watch. Um, but yeah, it is definitely, depending on the year, you can get really crazy mud or you could get like dried mud and it's hardened and mm -hmm. it's uneven and like they're called, they're just ankle breakers. Um, so yeah, I did roll my ankle a few times on those like hardened clay mud. Uh, but then yeah, later on, like I suffered through the worst like, boggy marshes of mud water snow melts off and uh yeah like you get weather also so yeah i consider it very uh, like a underrated mountain hundred for sure 
but it definitely is like any hundred, like the distances needs to be respected. Yeah, t- totally. I mean, and it's interesting. You mentioned the mud and like the dry mud and that's right. what I'm going to tell people. Like, look, it's not like it was not muddy. We got yeah. our fit, feet wet, wet and dirty. Like you will right. have blisters. But on yeah. top of that, then there's segment that would have been muddy. And well, my yeah. feet are already muddy. But right. instead, it's this super uneven ground where you have to think, okay, like I'm supposed to be running because it's kind of flat. But if I run, I might break my ankle. Like it was that bad sometimes. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. I, I had, it's crazy. And I, I rolled it quite a few times. And a lot of people around me, same thing. You always mm. hear like someone say, ah, <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, that just happened. <laughs> Hopefully nothing too bad. Right. And then, yeah, the baby head rocks, like kicking them. Like if you're not picking mm-hmm. your feet up high enough, like definitely lifted some toenails. Uh, so that'll be fun to pull off in the next couple of days. And I think, you know, when we think mountain race, sometimes we think more about the cliff and like you Ray is an obvious one, you know, that like it, who would say you Ray is not the mountain race. That would be insane. <laughs> and like, you have the cliff right, right there and it, it's very yeah. like, Oh, if I trip, I'm going to die. Yeah. But I don't think it necessarily needs to be like that because Bighorn was never like that. I think we were never kind of exposed, like in terms of cliff wise, like we were exposed above tree line, but yeah, it, it's a different kind of mountain, but it's still very much up and down, up and down technical, except some segment. Uh, right. We're kind of rolling. Yeah. Rolling we were, a bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. We had like these really cool plains, like mountainous plains, like you were just in this open field and like, they're like, cathedral wall like mountainous walls like around you uh which are really cool rock formations and then yeah i mean there was the tongue river uh that passed through the canyon uh which was super pretty um yeah so basically i mean yeah there were sections i guess going up like from the waterfall or like the river like where it was kind of steeper and like yeah, you could probably hurt yourself if you weren't careful and like fell down. But yeah, for the most part, like it wasn't like the high exposure, uh, like ball bearing um, stuff that you would see out in like the San Juans or yeah, things like that. But still like it's an underrated mountain hundred and it's an amazing 30 year old, 31 year old race um, with a great community. Yeah, I um I remember that from last year. I really thought they had a um that still that small town uh race feel and race vibe and um even like the the swag and the t shirt just kinda of feels old school, like you know, it's a mm-hmm. cotton shirt and it's got maybe some eighty style font on it or something like that, you know. Right. Yeah, no, it's a good time out in uh cowboy country. Well, congrats again, Anthony. Um what is what does recovery look like this week? Um after an event like that, after an effort like that of um, just digging deep and, and crushing uh, the competition there at Bighorn, what is what is the um, the, the week look like for recovery? Um, yeah, so the recovery is a lot of protein, uh, like I've said before. Uh, but yeah, getting back on a regular sleep schedule, the first couple nights were really bad. Uh, just a lot of adrenal, like up serotonin levels and... Uh, yeah, the endocrine system needed a reset. So finally getting like eight hours of sleep uh, after like the second night was uh, was very crucial. Uh, daily movement, like every 15 minutes, like get up to walk, stretch, uh, do something like some mobility. Um, yeah, I got into the gym today. So today's four days after the race. Uh, but yeah, taking care of the feet was the most crucial thing, uh, from this, uh, from this race, uh, in my perspective, like the body feels pretty good. Uh, yeah. Tending to some, like the ankle roll. So like getting a massage later this week as well. Um, yeah, that's kind of the plan. Like the first kind of 10 days after the race, uh, I don't run, but I'm still active. Like I'll go hike, uh, I need to still just catch up on like uh, the home home life like that I've neglected all the chores um, with my significant other. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I got back to work on Monday 
So this week has just been work, but yeah, just mostly getting the mind to calm down. I mean, with, yeah, I, the thing is like social media blows things up and like, you just get, you just want all this attention, like you get all this attention. It's, uh, it can go to your head sometimes. So I'm just like, all right, put the phone down. Uh, you, you've been staring at like Instagram for so long. Like, yeah, you, I can get sucked into the likes and comments, Mm -hmm. like just answering people, uh, through the DMS uh, from time to time. So like, that's kind of like how the beginning of the week was like, I was just so amped Uh, and like anyone should be after winning a race like this, uh, or of this magnitude. Um, but yeah, it's just like, okay, remember, like, you're just Anthony at the end of the day. Like if you didn't have this good of a race result, like you're just yourself and just go about your normal day. So yeah, I would just recovery wise is like eating enough, sleeping enough, and then listening to the body cues, like fixing the rolled ankle, uh, going to do body work and, uh, yeah, just all these little things that, uh, are very important in the long run. Yeah, that that's really cool to hear. And I mean, yeah, if you didn't win, you're still Anthony, but I think people appreciate you. I think you're a very positive uh, kind of figure in the running world. Um, so hopefully you, you do know that. And But it's it's true. <laughs> yeah. If you don't win, not as many people will DM you and say like, hey, congratulations on the, you know, I'm on the 17th place. Like if we talk Fuji, I'm sure you right. can hear it as much but it doesn't mean that people think any less of you i mean certainly not us like i mean you're you're a great runner and sometimes we have good day and sometimes we don't um yeah it doesn't mean right it's it's no impact on you i think you're such a positive guy um and i mean i the first time i saw you actually was you were volunteering at ura and i was like oh okay who's that guy i think it's brian told me like that's the guy who won last year i was like wait what is he doing Mm, here like okay yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's amazing, you know, and right. that's important to remember. Yeah, I definitely love to give back to the races or try to at least give back uh, in some way via volunteering. Like, I think I was aid station captain in 22 at Weehawken, and then 23 I was out crewing some friends and also volunteering at Ironton. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, again, like results they don't define you like yeah it's cool to say like oh i won this or won that but like yeah i think just trying to be a positive good person and like a rising tide brings up all ships so yeah it like if i can motivate the next person and then it's just a trickle down effect like for myself like if I were to see, like, I didn't see many Asian athletes on the start line of many ultras and like, it's hopefully I can inspire like another generation. Um, and then like during the race, like I saw like uh, a couple of African American athletes, uh, which was Amer- which is amazing. Like they probably don't see them represented on start lines and they're doing something that will inspire others. So yeah, it's not about the results. Like they're cool, but um, yeah, I think we're all in this for different reasons. And I'm I'm just trying to see where my body can take me. And if like I get a good result, like super. But um, yeah, I just want to experience all of these wonderful places with my two feet and like my good friends on the trail that I that I meet out there um yeah so it's just yeah. sharing this amazing experience for sure yeah and i think it ties back a lot to basically how the whole discussion started you know like not everyone is there to win race but the sport is bringing a lot to people um mm-hmm. potentially troubled past and it gives them a way to, to kind of channel their energy towards something that is more positive so by right. by representing people and um, people can see them in, in anthony maybe not winning race but uh being out there, I think it's very positive for a lot of people and can bring a lot of positiveness to, yeah, to life in general, to people in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I 
think like the bright hair, like my tattoos, like just it's You're very easy to recognize. <laughs> it's very easy to recognize me, but like it's very different than like I just yeah stand out like, but it's very different than most people, and it's just like okay, like oh, people may want to talk to you or like you have a story to say, um, but yeah, we're all just in this weird experience and no one has it figured out um well some people have it figured out but uh yeah like again i have bad races just as much as i have good races and yeah it's it's just really just trying to stay humble and uh keep the keep the glass half full not get too high not get too low mentality Well, hopefully the preparation for Quebec Mega Trail is going well. Um, I'll see you there. And obviously, I'm from there. So if you have any questions, oh, okay. uh, you should really let me know. Um, I can definitely teach you a few French-Canadian <laughs> sentences so that people think mm. you're actually from there and they will for oh, sure okay. chuckle. Um, so Some okay. insult, or not insult, but kind of the F word equivalent and the <laughs> shit word equivalent. Um, yeah. People will definitely crack up if you kind of blurt it out without an accent so i can oh I my can gosh you there okay yeah we will talk offline about that <laughs> um yeah like again yeah recovery is just taking it day by day we have like two weeks before the race so mm -hmm. it's just listening like just doing all the little things uh not doing too much like again it's just bouncing back to feel as fresh as possible for that um but yeah I, i'll listen to the body signs We wish you the best of success um, in all you do um, this year and moving forward. Anthony, where could our listeners um, check you out on, on social media if they're interested in following you? Yeah, thank you again uh, for having me on the podcast. Um, you can find me on Instagram. It's uh, at Anthony, the letter C as in cat, and then Lee94. Um, <laughs> it's my middle initial. Um, and then Strava um, is also a best bet. Yeah, I'm pretty much active on those two. Um, yeah, you can DM me on Strava DMs now that there's that and Instagram <laughs> DMs um, as always. Uh, yeah, and if you're in Colorado, uh, in Boulder, just, yeah, I'm always down to go for a run, take you up the local trails. It, it's pretty amazing out here. So, yeah, appreciate you guys and thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, hopefully see you out guys out on the trails and I'll definitely see Simon in two weeks. Um, if everything yeah. goes accordingly. I mean, at the starting line only, just so we're clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully everything goes well in the recovery. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank East you, guys. Coast, East Coast. Yeah. Yeah, I might take you up on that, Anthony. I um, I live on the western slope of Colorado, and I was just telling you offline that I might be coming out to Boulder to do a little project myself. So mm -hmm. I might hit you up. But um, Yeah, that'd be yeah, great. We, we, should, we wish you the best of success, and thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Simon. Have a great evening. You too.